Oh. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Stop the Madness, a Practical Guide to Making Your Data Catalog Strategy Work, sponsored today by Metric Insights. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. And to find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Mike Smithman and Marius Moscovici. Mike is the VP of Sales and Marketing at Metric Insights and has over 15 years of product and marketing experience in the business intelligence industry. He helped bring analytic products to market with senior roles at Seagate Software and AIM Technology, Tea Leaf, Xero, and Good Data. Marius has over 20 years of experience in analytics and data warehousing. Marius is the CEO of Metric Insights, the leading provider of a BI portal that helps organizations organize their BI environments and ensure users are getting the actionable data they need. And with that, I will give the floor to Marius and Mike to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us and uh, we're excited to be here. Um, wanted to talk today about governance, and I think uh, you know the title is is about stopping the madness because uh, we just see sort of the same kind of error repeating itself over and over. I just can't tell you how many how many you know customers and and other you know partners we've talked to uh, who who just describe a lot of the challenges that they're having around uh, in deploying governance tools effectively. And you know, they have they'll they're either just you know geez we're just getting started and really having a hard time figuring out how to make a, take advantage of the data governance tools we have, or, you know, we purchased uh, this tool and we've had it in place for, for uh, uh, years and it's not really getting a lot of traction within the organization. And so what's going on there. And so we're going to talk today about that and hopefully give you some really uh, very specific, tangible, you know, practical advice as to how to make sure that uh, you are getting uh, the most out of your data governance tools, and you're and you're leveraging and getting success out of that, so that uh, you're not part of that, you know, 80% uh, that uh, of of, of uh, data governance initiatives that fail, according to Gartner, because that's not where you want to be. So we're going to talk about, uh, you know, why people do data governance. You know, what what are the drivers? What are the things that usually initiate these projects? Uh, how people are typically trying to solve governance problems. Uh, and then and then what is the, you know, why some of the approach around data governance today doesn't really work? You know, where is it that it just it fails and it fails repeatedly? And then uh, we're going to talk about how you can leverage really a, a BI portal as sort of the missing piece in this whole puzzle to, to really fit everything together and make it work. So, uh, so first, like, so you know, what what is it? How does this all work, happen, right? So the, the governance initiatives typically get initiated because people feel pain, right? And the pain comes from lack of governance, of course, right? So, what are the kinds of things that people see that, that drive governance initiatives? Well, of course, is compliance. Uh, I've got to make sure GDPR regulations are adhered to. I've got maybe other regulatory requirements that are there around making sure that I know where my PII data is. I'm handling all the data in a responsible way. Um, all those things sort of drive initially and for probably from maybe the primary drivers for, for starting up governance initiatives. But there's a lot more beyond compliance. Right? People want to enable data discoverability. The idea of saying, well, what use is it if I have all this amazing data and all these tables and all these sources, if some new analyst comes on board and they are not aware of the fact that the data is present in this particular data warehouse that can serve them, that can answer a particular question, well, then it's not, it's no use to them. And, and if it's, if you're only able to see the things that you're given access to, then, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of limitations on how you can work if you can't discover and request access to things. Consistency is very important. So uh, you know, obviously, want to make sure that that your data is clean, uh, and that and that it's you know, it same definitions apply across the board. So if you're measuring sales, it's being measured the same way, irrespective of which of a set of tables that you're connected to. 
you know, lineage. People want to be able to understand, hey, where does this data come from? Is this is this originally coming from our this sales number originally coming from our Salesforce system? Uh, is it coming from the data warehouse? What are the different hops that it's gone through to get here? Uh, you know, all those things color the way that you interact with the information. And so as an analyst and often even as a business user, the lineage of the data that you're working with is critically important to make sure that you're using the information correctly. And then quality. Right, so you want to have a, a, a grasp on data quality, uh, be able to know when uh, it's not there, right? So when there's a problem with the data, be able to identify it, but also be able to know areas where there have been no data quality issues and things that people are resolving and working on. So having uh, uh, identifying that and then generating transparency around data quality is a key uh, uh, aspect of uh, folks that are working with um, initiating data governance projects. And, and so what happens? Well, you know, you typically somebody looks around and says, well, what are the technologies out there that can help me with this suite of problems that we just talked about? And the answer comes back, aha, it's the data catalog, right? There are all these technologies, um, whether it's Purview or Alation or Calibra or, uh, you know, Google's data catalog or whatever, you, you, you know, you choose some piece of technology that, it, that you say, well, handles a lot of these kinds of features as features that support those requirements. And that I'm going to be able to use this technology uh, to, to solve the problem, right? And what happens after that? Well, you deploy the catalog in your environment. Then next, you bring in all your metadata. So you you crawl all of the different data sources you might have. Maybe there there are things out in your cloud, some of your data warehouse uh, files, you know, uh, your Hadoop cluster, whatever you have. It kind of goes out there and crawls everything. Your your BI tools and brings all, it sucks in all the metadata associated with everything you have. And then you go in and, you know, of course, set feature capabilities to say, I want to auto tag sensitive data. So now, you know, where's the PII data, it, it, you know, where, where is it that we have names and social security numbers and emails in the data, make sure you've got a good inventory of that and control over that. These tools will generate lineage for you. So you'll be able to figure out maybe if you're crawling the scripts, like TL scripts, or even using something like Informatica, uh, it might be able to tell you, you know, how, where is this data coming from? What are the transformation, the rules that are being used to populate it into the target from the source? Uh, it might even be able to tell you all the way to the BI tool where you can look and see, uh, I have this uh, Power BI dashboard and I can see that this data is coming from a particular data set that is being sourced from my uh, from from my SQL Server environment, and here's how it, it all gets into enroll it gets rolled up into this solution that I'm looking at, uh, and then uh, once you've got all this automatically collected data, oftentimes is an initiative to to create a glossary within this, these systems. So to say, well, let's make sure that we define these key terms like sales and customer and and you know all the things that I'm that I'm interested in measuring can find those enterprise KPIs in a way that is consistent so that now I can say, I'm gonna get buy-in from the business. This is how we're gonna define these things. This is how we're gonna measure them everywhere that we that we use them. So that, that's often part of this initiative as well. So, and then finally, ownership, right? So you wanna be able to say, well, here's the particular business user that's responsible for this glossary term, that's responsible for, uh, here's the technical users who are responsible for uh, these particular Tableau dashboards or these data sets that you've onboarded into these uh, data catalogs. Uh, for, uh, you know, they, they, they're the ones that are build the rules and the ones that are maintaining it. Uh, they're the ones that you need to go to if you, if you either want to request access to it because you don't have it, or uh, you have a question about how to use the information. So, there, so all of that information, all gets encapsulated, loaded, either on an automated fashion or manually into your data catalog. And once you're done with that, you maybe flag some data quality issues to identify to people what, you know, where are the issues where, where they should be aware of, of problems, and then you launch. So what happens after that? Well, you announce to the whole organization, here's this cool data, uh, we have this new data cataloging tool. You can get all this information about business terms and lineage and uh, data, and you can discover data, you can request access data, it's all there for you, uh, go at it, right? And, and what you'll typically find is that, well, initially there's quite a bit of interest uh, in this and that everyone's very curious, what is this thing, what do I find, what can I find in it? Um, you, you get a, you know, a spike in adoption where lots of folks are logging on, but then 
you know, surely as the sun rises, uh, it sets as well. And unfortunately, I, you know, it will you, very quickly. I mean, we see this over and over again. Usage of these of these technologies just drops off precipitously. So, you know, three months, six months after the launch, if you look back and you say, well, who's using this? Um, no business users are using it. And then out of the entire analyst community, you're lucky if you got maybe 10% of them are actually engaged with it, right? And the rest of them are not, are not going back to it. You know, they're just not getting the value out of it. And, and this is where really the, the big disappointment comes and, and, and where people really scratch their head and they're not really sure what to do next, right? And so, you know, to address this, I think the first step is to really understand like what's wrong with that approach? Why didn't does that not work? Why can't we just, you know, bring in this, all this really valuable metadata, add these valuable glossary terms in place, assign ownership, you know, organize all this stuff, launch it and have it be something that people are really engaged with in a sustained way. So it's generating ongoing value. So looking at that, there are a couple of reasons or three primary reasons I would maintain why this is sort of doomed to failure, why it's madness to assume that this kind of approach would work. First of all, these tools, really it's true about all of them, they're complex and fairly difficult to use, right? They're really powerful technologies. So data catalog, I mean, you know, it can do all these things. It can, you know, mine all of your tables and identify PI data and do these associations and bring in information and link things to BI tools. It, it, they're, they're incredibly powerful, but they're also very, very complex. They have, they have to support different kinds of workflows, all kinds of different user requirements. Every organization is a bit different. And so they're not something that you can just sort of log into without any understanding of what technology is what that technology is on a casual basis, like once in a month, and, and use and come back to very easily. There's a le learning curve involved, and that learning curve is a very significant barrier. The second big obstacle to making this successful is that inherently there's a huge amount of clutter in these environments, right? When you think about it, you have a data ca a catalog tool. Its whole purpose is to go out and crawl and bring in the metadata for everything that is in your environment. Well, the good news is you have everything in your environment. And the bad news is you have everything in your environment, right? You, you're not like if you've got not only the really high value fact tables in your data warehouse that have been meticulously created, carefully, you know, it, 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 maintained through data with data quality scripts and 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 you know validation and so forth but you also have the table that it was created uh, three years ago by an analyst that's no longer there that's a duplicate of another table that's not being maintained you know that's being brought in as well and this and in most organizations organizations of any size there are so many of those objects that are really not high value objects that the, the clutter is insurmountable, right? If I, if I you do a search inside your data catalog, so you, you get something useful, but you also get just a ton of junk, right? So that make, that's a huge barrier to adoption. And then finally, and in many ways, maybe even most importantly, if you think about it, the data catalog tool is really not part of anyone's user flow. Maybe apart from like the governance team or the folks that are you know maintaining that technology, it, it's it's certainly not a part of the business users flow. Right? What are your business users doing? They're going into either a dashboard to find information, um, or maybe they're looking at spreadsheets uh, on SharePoint. They're they're going to all the places where their information resides and looking at that information. They're not thinking, oh, let me go to the catalog to see what the glossary definition term is for for sales. Right? That, that's disconnected from their experience. But also your analysts, they're not really, they have a flow that's completely divorced from these tools as well, because they're inside of the BI tools. So they're in Power BI, they're in Tableau, they're in Click, they're building out, or maybe they're in, they're in Excel building out a model, right? They're building things out for consumption by the business users. And, you know, very seldom, you know, why would they think to go to a data catalog, right? Unless, unless they're specifically have a very compelling reason to just get, continue doing what they're doing. And, and so it's just a natural progression that as you roll these tools out, unless there's a, there's a way to reach them with that information, the information will not get to them. They just won't go there. So what do you do about that? I mean, clearly, these are just sort of fundamental, you know, 
behavioral challenges. And so it's not, you know, not, you can't make the data catalog tool really simple because it's, it's not, right? And, and nor can you change the workflows where people work. And the, 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 all that information has to be crawled and has to be presented. So we maintain, you know, what I would say is a sort of a practical approach here is to, is to really take another step, is to recognize that implementing the data catalog is a first and necessary step to really get your governance in order, but it's not sufficient to solve the entire problem. In that, in order to solve the entire problem, you have to take that metadata that you've collected in the catalog, not all of it, but the good stuff, and you want to make sure we deliver it to the point of consumption. That is, to the place where the analyst and the business user are interacting with your data assets every day. Right? So that means, and, and when we talk about metadata here, we're not just talking about just, you know, I should clarify, I'm talking about a more nuanced view of things. So clearly, for example, the metadata that you have, from government's perspective, some of it's in the data catalog, some of it's other things that, that that data catalog is broad, but not all of it, because there may be BI tools that contain some of the data, metadata that haven't been integrated in the catalog. Typically, a data catalog might work with Power BI or with Tableau, but not with both. Um, or, or maybe it works with both, but not with click. Uh, you know, so you have a, uh, there are going to be some, there's going to be some metadata that's going to be present in the BI tools that's not in the catalog. And you need to present that to users. You also have metadata oftentimes that's in Excel. So there's a whole class of reporting assets, sort of user-generated reports, which are not being created in a BI tool. They're probably not in your data catalog at all. But these also have metadata that has to be captured. And oftentimes is metadata that the business itself is maintaining, you know, tagging, uh, uh, glossary term definitions, things of that nature that maybe they haven't, you know, they're not using the data catalog every day, they don't want to, but it's easy enough for them to maintain it in Excel. So you've got to have a solution that brings that metadata in, knits it together with the data catalog and BI tool, and then brings it in to, it, at the point of consumption. And then finally, when you onboard your content, the natural process of saying, you know, I'm going to have a governed space and I'm going to bring in all my different BI assets, I'm going to bring it into this governed environment, that process as well oftentimes has an opportunity to collect metadata, maybe adding a description where one was not very clearly defined, or maybe making some associations to, to glossary terms or, or tags or adding custom information things that, that help with data literacy, that help people round out the metadata that's already there. There has to be a process by which you can collect and absorb that into the whole ecosystem that you're presenting to users at the point of consumption. And a key principle, you know, absolutely pivotal principle to think about as you think about surfacing metadata, and as even this applies to content itself, Right, is that there's really this iceberg phenomena that happens with our with our information assets, whether they be data sets inside of a data warehouse or they be BI tool dashboard reports, things of that nature. And that is that you know if you think of that iceberg, there's that that classic you know 90% of the iceberg is below the water, right? And you see the top 10%. So you want the same thing here. You want to take the top small percentage of content that's really useful and make sure that that is the thing that's above the waterline. That's the stuff that's discoverable to users, right? And these are the things that are vetted, that has quality, that has, they're not duplicative, et cetera. Whether it's the data or the BI assets, supplies in both cases. And then the rest of it, the vast, massive amount of stuff that's there, but, but it's, it's really not very useful, keep below the water, keep it out of view. Because then users can have a, a appreciation of what's there and they can really understand how to engage with information and you're not overwhelming them with clutter as they're trying to find you know that piece of useful information you know that data set that i'm going to use to build my analysis or that dashboard report that i'm going to you know use to be able to understand what's going on in my business right i, I, I want to make sure that the, the things that the, all the clutter the stuff that's redundant the things that are obsolete they're just hidden from so this is a key, key principle to keep in mind. And then also very important, you wanna think about this whole journey and the way that you're gonna support people from a governance perspective. 
you, as, in a way where you're not just sort of a one size fits all approach, right? Because the governance needs and the consumption needs for somebody who's a business user, you know, they're looking for something completely different from the content publisher, the person who's you know, creating Tableau and Power BI dashboards or, or pushing uh, uh, spreadsheets out used broadly within the organization. Um, th those experiences are very different and their needs are very different from the data governance profession. A person who's, who's charged with, hey, we got to be in compliance and we got to make sure these governance initiatives are really generating the value that we expect them to. And so your solution that you come up with needs to be carefully targeted towards what, what the persona that we're working with, right? And so let's do a kind of a, a, a deeper dive into that. What do we mean by that? And then I wanna, what we'll look to do is to give you some actual examples. You know, we don't want this presentation to just be about the theoretical. We wanna give you some examples of kind of how does this play out in, in reality? You know, if you create a governed environment that brings all of your governance metadata to the user at the point of consumption, what are they getting? From it, right? So from a business user perspective, what do they want? If you think about that persona. Well, as a business user, I want to find ev everything in a single place, right? The definition of good governance is that there is a single pane of glass through which I consume all my content, um, and, and, and there's a filter applied so that that junk is not there, right? And, and that's, that's what I care about as a business user. I want to be able to know I'm looking at this. I can trust whatever I find. I'm not going to be stumbling into something that after I do my analysis, uh, someone will tell me, oh, you know, that's obsolete. There's a completely new dashboard that you're supposed to be using for that. You know, that, that's not, not going to happen. I also want to be able to find content from anywhere, right? So I should be able to be on my, uh, uh, in my desktop on the portal. I should be, I can do it in Slack or Microsoft Teams. I can do it on mobile. So kind of having access to, to the information that I want to be able to consume from anywhere, from any surface is, is going to be very important to me. And then, I, and then it's very important to be able to identify, find and request access to discoverable content. So security is obviously of paramount importance, right? You're, or you're going to have an access model in place that controls who has access to what content. <coughs> but unless, you know, the, but content, unless it's an HR report um, or some very sensitive piece of information that you want to hide the existence of that asset from everyone, unless you have that, more often than not, you want to make sure people know that there is a report that exists with this particular title, with this description, with this general metadata, even if they don't have access to it. There's lots of assets that fall into this category because you, for two reasons. One, as a business user, you want people to know, oh, okay, this exists. Let me go request access to this so that I don't, uh, you know, rather than, oh, I'm going to go and ask my analyst to go create this. And now I have a duplicate piece of content. Somebody's wasted their time rebuilding something that did not exist before. And I just didn't know that it didn't exist because I was looking for it, and didn't find it because it was hidden from me. So having discoverable content and being able to request access is, is, a, is a key, key aspect of good governance. Right? And then from a data literacy perspective as a business user, I need to be able to understand you know, what am I looking at? So if I'm seeing a report and it's measuring sales, well, how are sales defined here? And, and what is the, you know, where is it, where does it come from? What are the, what are the, the key rules? Uh, is this gross sales or net sales, you know, et cetera and so forth, right? So I want to be able to understand all of the information, the definition, the extended metadata, the lineage that will tell me what I'm looking at, help me gain deeper understanding of the, of the information and make sure that I'm using that information correctly and not misusing it because I misinterpreted it from a data literacy perspective. And then I also want to make sure as a business user that I understand what the data usage constraints are around the data. What I mean by that? Well, if I'm looking at a report and it contains a restricted data, what does that mean? Um, am I allowed to share that only with certain parts of my organization, but not everyone else? If it's flagged as confidential, does that mean it can go to anyone in my organization or only certain groups? And what about partners? Um, you know, what, what, and which data sets, can, which reports have uh, contain public information that I can share broadly, right? So making sure that I really, and I, I not only see that something is restricted, but I understand how that is to, supposed to be used in a way that will keep me 
can, can, in adherence with the key governance practices that are in place in the organization. Right. So with that, let's show you some examples. Yeah, thanks, Mary. So I'm going to take over for a minute here and um, kind of talk about what this might look like in, in practice. Um, obviously, you know, looking at, at our platform here, but, you know, generally the concepts in, involved with what Marius has, has been speaking about. So, you know, from a business user perspective, um, as Marius said, you know, a, a lot of business users are not really leveraging um, the, the data catalog um, on, on a daily basis. And you know, for this example, we're going to be showing some examples with Alation, but whatever your catalog might be. Um, and so the first step really is being able to you know, bubble up the tip of that iceberg, as Marius was talking about, from a content perspective in, into a centralized space that curates just the, the assets and the content from whatever source it might be coming from in, into, uh, into a centralized catalog or portal that um, business users will come to and will engage with to, to look at the content that they're interested in on a daily basis. And an example is here where you know, each, of these, um, each of these tiles here is content that we've curated you know, either directly or through the data catalog into um, the centralized space coming from, you know, as you can see, BI tools, maybe Excel files on file stores, documents up on SharePoint to, you know, individual metrics and data sets that might be interesting to a particular set of users. So, you know, step one is, is about, you know, doing that sort of curation of, of content for the business user and getting it into a, a space where, um, again, it is more user friendly and that they can engage with it. Um, and during that process, as, as we said about before, and as Marius alluded to, you know, through the process of, of curating that content and publishing it, we're going to be pulling in metadata from a number of different sources, whether it's the data catalog, as we'll see, whether it's the BI tool itself, whether it's manually or spreadsheets, regardless of where that metadata is being captured, we want to make sure that we deliver it alongside the asset so that the user knows exactly the context behind it and is literate around it. So in this scenario, you know, clicking on this Tableau dashboard here, you know, we get a preview of it coming from the, the, the underlying BI tool. We probably pick up the name and description from the underlying BI tool to, as well. But that's augmented in this case with some fields that are coming, um, you know, both from relation in this case, that uh, you know, are defining that the, the data is confidential, that it's been through an approval process, that it's relevant to a particular line of business. You know, we're also linked up to Calibra in our demo environment. You know, typically you're not going to have two, two data catalogs, one's hard enough. So, um, but again, you know, wherever the source is, um, pulling that in and making sure it's delivered automatically alongside the, the, the asset itself. And then, as, as Marius said, you know, through the um, um, publishing process, you may add in additional information. So, you know, we may have a glossary that's been defined in the data catalog or that you're defining as part of the publishing process where, you know, we define key metrics or indicators, how they're calculated. We talked about ownership, who, who is responsible for these definitions uh, and these, these assets that we're looking at so that there's accountability behind them. So, you know, as a user, whether I'm looking at, you know, a Tableau dashboard, whether I'm looking at a spreadsheet, you know, which is, is what we have here, that the result is the same. I get the context behind it. Um, I get the metadata behind it. And obviously, if it's something that I'm interested in, I can click into that particular asset and um, interact with it as I would usually, but with the context of all that metadata that we spoke about before. Um, and for some users, it, it might make sense to be able to get back to the catalog, but rather than you know having to search through that and find this asset, as Mary said, it being sort of outside of my workflow, you know, if I do want to go into the catalog and look at this, then you know, it should be linked to it. I should be able to click through. Now we're into Alation. 
we're looking at this asset within Alasia, and then I've got other, you know, potentially other metadata here that we haven't deemed is sort of necessary for everyone from a from a business perspective, and I can drill into that in more detail. But it becomes seamless, and I can I can you know see it as part of my workflow. So getting everything in, in, in this sort of single pane of glass is, is critical. Um, linking it back and making sure that we're collecting the necessary metadata automatically and we're you know, associating that with the, with the relevant assets is kind of the, 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 the backbone be, behind getting the catalog information out to the users. Um, using that then within a search paradigm so you know being able to come in as a user who's got access to a whole lot of categories of content and uh, um, you know across different tools and technologies but to be able to come in and search across that catalog making use of, of all the metadata that we've ingested to understand you know what what it is a particular user is looking for being able to filter out searches by that metadata so that we can you know, really narrow in on, again, what a user might be looking for out of the body of content that they've got access to. So leveraging all that work that you've done in the catalog, um, again, from a business user perspective as it relates to search and only searching typically through that curated content is, is critical. Um, so here you can see I've got a ranked set of results. Here's all the metadata that we've associated with it. And that's effectively what we're searching through to bring back this set of results. Um, and again, though, you know, for some users, um, maybe they want to go beyond that um, set of curated content. So you know, maybe we do want to search back into, in our case, the Alation catalog. So being able to do that seamlessly again as part of my workflow, I don't have to open up another application and run the same search and figure out, okay, what was in there versus not. You know, passing that search seamlessly into your data catalog tools so that you can leverage that search engine, you know, look beyond it, see actually that there's multiple versions of this report out there. Um, and, and this is the one that we've actually curated into the uh, catalog. You know, maybe I'm looking into that sort of stuff because you know, I want to see what, what other versions are available. So again, incorporating that into the workflow is kind of critical to driving usage again of, of the underlying catalog tool as well. So you know, from a business user perspective, you know, making sure you have this single pane of glass, making sure they're looking through the content that is, is only relevant to them, um, helps drive that engagement and, and get usage of the work that you're putting in in, in the back end. Um, the other piece that, that Marius has, has touched on a few times from a, from a particularly business user perspective, but really everyone, is typically when you're curating something into a centralized catalog, you're going to uh, apply and synchronize the necessary permissions and security around that. So typically when I come in as a user, I'm logged in as Sam here, they're responsible for sales and marketing. You know, typically my permissions are going to dictate what content I get access to, what I search through, you know, based on my role in the organization. However, you know, most content, again, as Marius said, unless it's super sensitive and you don't want people to know it exists, most content you want to make what we, we would call discoverable. So even though I don't have access to something, you know, if I'm interested in searching for you know, reports around procurement data, I should be able to run those searches, it look through the metadata, and it highlight any discoverable content related to procurement. So in this case, I can see this procurement dashboard. I can see the metadata associated with it, you know, what it contains, the classification of the data, who owns it, the tags and, and glossary terms associated with it. Even though I don't have access to it because it's blurred out the image and the padlock on it, I can see that. But I should be able to go and request access to that particular asset now, rather than reaching out to my BI team and saying, hey, can you create me a procurement report because I, I didn't know one existed already. So making content discoverable beyond sort of the security and permissions that people have, again, is critical to sort of driving increased engagement with everything that you have out there that you want people looking for. Thank you.
to the slides. Thank you, Mike. So, so we've sort of looked a little bit at the, at the first persona, the business user. And, and I think shifting gears in a moment, if we think about the content publisher, you know, this is the person who's responsible for creating the content that the business user is going to be looking at every day. You know, they have needs from a governance perspective that you want to make sure you're addressing and filling in the gaps beyond just here's the data catalog, right? They want to be able to search for content and, and they want to be able to figure out like what are the certified data sets that I should use to build a, a new visualization. And this is particularly important if maybe it's a new data analyst or somebody just coming into or a data analyst moving from one group to another. Now there's a new domain. They don't know in already in detail all the different tables, what they should rely on. All too often, you need to talk to people and get that insights just directly. And, and, and if you, the right person's not available to talk to you, you, you're out of luck, right? So being able to figure out, okay, here are the trusted data sets, certified data sets that I can build visualizations from, very important. Understanding kind of lineage, right? So I can see, well, if I'm, if I'm looking at doing, trying to do an analysis, obviously as a good analyst, I'm almost always first checking to see what already exists out there. So I might see here's a dashboard. Well, I want to know what's the lineage for that, and 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 what how to and and the published data sets and understanding you know when perhaps with this dashboard contain the information I already need. Well, oh, it's coming from this particular source that I know is a trusted source, and therefore I can go ahead and use this as the basis of my analysis. Uh, tracking usage, I think it's very important for your content. So if I'm publishing content, you know it ought not to be kind of a fire and forget model. Right. All too often, people, analysts will build something, they'll give it to their users, and then they'll kind of move on to the next thing down their queue, and they just don't pay any more attention to the thing that they just created. Well, that's that's fine in the moment, but what you really need to do is be able to tune your 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 what you're going to be working on based on how you're doing in the past. You know, are the things you're creating have a sustained engagement through the users? You know, of the of the six things you created in the last month, were were three of them incredibly successful, uh, where they're continuing to get engagement, and, and three of them were not? Well, you want to know which ones are which because you can identify then maybe some patterns that will help you make sure that you're spending your time as an analyst in a way that generates the most value going forward. So getting those usage trends across all the content in the in your system, not just the, you know, whether it's Tableau or Power BI or spreadsheets, you know, anything, any content you publish, understanding how that's used, very important from a governance perspective, because then you can change your behavior going forward to maximize value and learn from what's working and what's not. Right? And then the ability from, from, a, from a feedback cycle perspective, um, it's important to not only look at the numeric counts, not only, oh, how many people have actually visited this dashboard, but like, what do people think about it, right? I, in I, an ideal world, you'd have uh, somebody running surveys all the time and getting that information from users. But in reality, that's just not going to happen. You know, if you users, business analysts are not out there, don't have time to go out there and, and continuously survey their user community to find out like, what do they really think of the content that's been created? They're too busy creating new content. So you need to have a, a governance platform that allows that feedback to be automatically collected and shared with the content publisher, right? So that they can say, oh, I can tell based on what people are saying, oh, this report is missing some things, right? Or they really like the fact that uh, how this is done, or there's some confusing usage of colors or conf confusing design elements or whatever that might be, right? So whether it's positive or negative feedback, having that feedback captured and circled back to the content publisher so they can improve that asset and also they can improve how they build future assets is vitally important. And then with all of this together, the idea is that as a content publisher, I need to have a mechanism to be able to promote my content, right? So uh, if I've published a dashboard and I look at my usage trends and I find that, oh, geez, I, I was expecting to get uh, I, all the users in this 300 user community to look at it. And in fact, only three are using it. Well, maybe some of them don't know about it, right? So how do I promote that content? How do I make sure that there's visibility and awareness of that happens? So, Mike will show you some examples of how that works. Yeah, so if we jump back into our, our catalog here, so you know, from, from a data set perspective, um, really we're, we're talking about the same thing, right? There's a lot of tables you know, in our underlying sources. We wanna be able to curate 
certain tables into into our catalog so that analysts can can find them and then we want to tie those to the lineage of, of the assets that we're looking at so yeah alongside our bi tools here i've also got certified data sets down the bottom here um, that i can obviously find within search as well if i'm you know, responsible for for you know data sets and being able to find those I can look through them. The metadata is again ingested either from the catalog or the underlying tool, wherever you're managing that metadata, searching down to typically the column level. Um, so that again, as a uh, as a, a, a content publisher, I can look at what has been certified, you know, what has been has has the necessary quality checks against it. So that if I'm going to build a particular asset. Um, I, uh, I know that, that this is a particular set of data that I can trust. And you know, if I drill into those again, you know, I may go through to the data catalog and look at the details. I may just you know, look at the details here within the portal. You know, what columns does this contain? How's it tagged? Who owns it? The things that we spoke about before, but also tying into that lineage. So again, maybe coming from the underlying catalog or inferred through the tool here where you know, I can see this particular data set is being used in, in a certain workbook, you know, certain worksheets within that workbook in Tableau in this case, and you know, beyond that in our case, so it's being used in a number of email distributions that are going out. And so I can tie this workbook back, you know, the Tableau one that we we're looking at before, back to the particular table or tables that, that are sourcing the data set behind it. So yeah, you know, lineage is is useful to the the content creator for sure, um, but but also potentially useful to the um, you know the user who is who is looking at this particular dashboard. You know, maybe I'm thinking about creating uh, another dashboard around sales. I, I I don't want to recreate things that are already there. Is this one using the data that I was planning on using? Well, if it is, then then this probably has the info in that I need. So. Yeah, lineage and metadata around data sets um, is, is critical for the, the content publisher. Um, second thing Mary spoke about was this idea of sort of tracking usage and, and collecting feedback. And you know, I think you really need both to, to really understand the true picture of, of whether a particular asset is, is working within the organization. So again, through the tools and through the portal, you want to be tracking um you know what what content is being used over time what's sort of meeting its shelf life what's going unused um get a view into you know the number of users and the number of views that a particular report is getting so in this case you know we're, we're analyzing this over the last 60 days we've got you know our most popular reports we've got reports that are increasing in popularity or, or data sets as well if, if we're using those decreasing what's going unused that maybe has, has become obsolete we need to get a view usage gives us sort of one view into the the usability and the usefulness of, of certain content and that should be down to you know a pretty detailed level so you know oftentimes similar to sort of the the charts marius showed in the slide when you launch a particular dashboard you know you will see a lot of usage if you promote that um, but over time you know if people don't actually find it useful they jumped in there to look at it you know, so we saw a lot of views, but over time uh, that usage drops off, then um, yeah, we need to do something about it. So just the fact that this had 924 views over the last 60 days did not necessarily tell us that it's a useful dashboard because we might see things like this, where this animation is showing us that for this report in the middle, you know, there's a whole bunch of people who sort of came in when we promoted it and over time, never came in again they're drifting to the outside of the circle and there's really only a very small percentage of the users who are coming back in every day and looking at this particular content and, and finding it useful so yeah maybe we need to revisit it and, and understand why these other users are, are not utilizing it so getting a comprehensive view of, of usage is important but then you know understanding things like why aren't these people looking at it and the only way to really do that is to gather feedback from your from your community. So you know, at the point of consumption, again, 
on any particular report or spreadsheet or whatever it might be, enabling users to give feedback, to you know, rate it, to collect comments around the particular asset or data set, whatever it might be. So that again, if I'm the owner of this particular report, I can understand both, you know, what was the engagement of this asset? I can see it dropped off over time, but also, you know, what was the feedback I was getting? Well, it looks like we might have replaced this report with something else. Therefore, you know, maybe it is obsolete and, uh, and it's something we should retire and take out of the clutter that we, that we have out there. So usage and feedback is important. Um, using that then to be able to promote content is sort of critical then to driving engagement with that um, set of content that you know you want to see an increase in, in engagement with because you know it's useful. Thank you, Mike. Final. So the final sort of persona that we want to talk about is data governance, right? The person is that or the group of folks that are responsible for making sure that the organization is in compliance with all those governance policies and that you're making the most use out of the data, right? And so they want to make sure that they can certify the reports and data sets that contain trusted data. Oftentimes that might mean uh, more nuance than just a blanket certification. Perhaps that, you know, they might designate gold, silver, um, bronze certification levels or you know, different rules associated with the, each of them, designate which assets qualify for each diff different uh, uh, certification levels. Basically, they wanna make sure all of that well, the rules are maintained, but but and then and that they're uh, applied in a consistent way across all the assets that are there, and then it's visible clearly to everyone in the organization when content is certified and when it's not. They also want to make sure that uh, sensitive data has been classified properly, right? So obviously, as we talked about at the beginning, the co you know, compliance is one of the key drivers. You want to make sure PII data is not shared in the way that's inappropriate. You want to make sure any kind of restricted content, if you're, if you're a, a public health company, that you know restricted data is not communicated outside of the folks that are privileged and have the ability to, to consume that, right? Because that would be a, that could, that could create all kinds of, uh, SEC violations and issues that, that you can find get fined on. So, is uh, even just sensitive information and, and confidential information. We'll make sure that doesn't get outside of the circle that it's supposed to be consumed by. So, uh, making sure all that classification takes takes place and there's mechanisms to do that is very important. Uh, and then, and then equally important, we need to make sure that the people that are consuming that content, the business users, that they understand which dashboards, which reports have sensitive data and how they should use that data, right? Because what's the use? What's the point in doing all this work as from a governance perspective and tagging those tables that have PII data, if in fact the people consuming that that data are consuming it through a dashboard and they have no way of knowing, knowing or being flagged that, hey, this has sensitive data or this has you know confidential or restricted information. So making sure that that flows all the way to the point of consumption and that users understand how they should consume that information, what are the limitations around that consumption, very important. And then if you're gonna do that, obviously being able to review and uh, the compliance around that. So did you, to what extent do we have users that have gone and said, here's sensitive content. I acknowledge the fact that I understand how to use that content. Uh, do I have a way to audit that and know so that I can guarantee that, I, that the, my practices are working and they're being communicated out? So let's... Uh, yeah, so let's, um, let's spend a couple of minutes looking at this, this last persona and then I see some questions coming in. So we'll, uh, we'll leave some time at the end for those. Um, so yeah, as, as Marius said, um, you know, certification of content is critical. And again, based on the, the data catalog that you're using, um, you know, certification may be happening as a workflow within the underlying catalog if it supports it potentially um, for, for certain content. And you know, obviously if you're doing that, you know, maybe you have an approval process or workflow, or maybe the tool supports an actual certification flag. If that happens, you know, obviously we want to curate that automatically into, into the, the catalog for users. So in our catalog here, you know, anything that has a, a sort of stamp of approval on it at a certain level is, is because that has been certified by a particular user on a particular date. And so again, this may be you know, synchronized up from your underlying catalog, 
or it may be something that happens if the curation process is happening directly within the catalog. So often what we'll see is that you know, we want to curate a set of content um, that, that exists in the organization, but we want to push that through a certain sort of workflow process that ensures you know, the certain stakeholders who are responsible for a particular asset have, have sort of done the checks and balances, have maybe added in any additional manual metadata, have done the data quality checks. We want to push a particular asset you know, that has been deemed something that we want to curate through stages of responsibility before it ultimately gets published and certified. And so the, the final result being that stamp of approval with, again, the accountability of, of who's, who's done it. So whether, again, it be a data set, a, a dashboard or a report, you know, curating the tip of the iceberg, but then certifying that content so users know they can trust it is, is critical so that when they come in and they're browsing and searching through it, they've got the necessary context around that certification. Um, we also spoke about um, um, you know, sort of the, the terms of service, if you like, around a particular asset. So making sure business users understand sort of the sensitivity of information and the classification of information. So in this case, yeah, we're simply publishing a spreadsheet to our end users and we're um, making that available within the catalog. So a you know, cash flow statement in this case, I've got the necessary metadata that we spoke about before. Um, but in this case, we've also made an announcement around this where we're informing the user that it, it does contain sensitive information. We've recognized that. And that there's actually usage policies around it, which users are responsible for actually going in and accepting that they've, they've read those and that they understand them. And so you know, delivering those policies alongside the asset directly to the user is critical in, in getting that information out there, but then tracking that as well. So you know, understanding who has accepted the policies and who hasn't, you know, ensures that we can keep track of that. You know, we can alert around this to say, okay, you know, out of all the people who have access to, to that particular asset, who are the ones who are yet to uh, accept the policies so that we can uh, reach out to them and make sure that they understand them. So again, if you're gonna go through the effort of, of um, um, tagging content, you know, setting sensitive information, classifying it, making sure the, the, the end users understand how they should be using it. And then you know, understanding that they know how they should be using it is, is critical to, to getting that information out there. So hopefully that's you know, given you some ideas around how you might get some better um, traction with some of the governance and catalog uh, efforts that you're putting in place. But with that, I guess, um, Shannon, maybe I'll hand it back to you to start fielding some of these questions that are coming in. Thank you both so much for this. Another great <coughs> presentation, great content, a lot of questions coming in just to answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording and anything else requested. Um, so diving in here is the, um, how do you recommend we get the data owners or stewards classify the to classify all the content if we did the cloud migration before having a data catalog? Um, so how do you, just, 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 oh, I see, sorry. Maybe the, how do you recommend we get the data owners or stewards classify all the content if we had first the migration? So, um, well, so the, it's obviously a challenge to get people to do, <laughs> to do classification and do the work of capturing the information. So the, the key aspect of it is to be able to see if you're going to create this kind of governing environment where you're promoting the things that are going to be searchable into the space, then the, the fact that the, the classification has to take place needs to be part of the fact of promoting it to be governed, right? So you're, you're, you're saying, okay, you've done all this work to promote your, to create your content. Now get the maximum amount of usage out of it, promote it in the environment. To do that, you need to, to add the classification information. And um, the idea is that you want to try to be really smart and make that process as lightweight as possible. So to the extent possible, obviously, data governance tools should 
identify certain auto classify content. And then if the things that you do want to manual classify, be very mindful about what those things are and pick the minimum highest value things, things like PII flag, you know, data classification, things that are, that are, that are vitally important, make it easy for them. So that kind of workflow that Mike showed is, is a great way to be able to do that, where really with a click or two in publishing the asset, they can simply do that. Right. And then you can, by virtue of ownership, you can use the feedback loop where you can notify people, hey, there's all these assets you have for publishing that have not been cost, that have not been acted upon, go in there. Um, and then in a few minutes, they can, they can apply those classifications. And so should we pick another question, I guess? Oh, yeah. Sarah, so, Sarah. so, um, uh, Sorry, so can you clarify if Metric Insights is a standalone data catalog or if it works in tandem with a data catalog tool to support typical end user workflow? So we are we are uh, uh, not a uh, what a classic st uh, standard data catalog in that we are a BI uh, portal solution that acts as a governance platform, right? This is the way we think of ourselves. So think about the fact that you know you want to bring all of your assets together in one governed environment, uh, but the classics or data catalog type functions like uh, uh, I, you know, auto classification of information, discovering discoverability PI data, all those things. Um, you're better suited doing all that in a classic data catalog solution. And then we integrate with all of the existing data catalog solutions out there so that you can leverage that and bring that metadata into metric insights together with other metadata that maybe is not in, metric, in the catalogs, like things that are people maintain the spreadsheets, et cetera. And then present that all to the user when they're consuming that, that uh, dashboard, that report, or that Excel spreadsheet. Perfect. So how do you change the culture on keeping keeping even metadata hidden, um, especially from a federal government background? Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you've got regulatory issues in place or if, if your federal government situation, you know, you're, you're bound by those. If if metadata is um, it has to be for some reason confidential or the, the, I know with the government work, there's oftentimes various classifications, very strict rules about even knowing about assets. Um, but even even within that, if you were to say, OK, uh, you know, maybe I can't let anyone, everyone know, but but oftentimes there's a larger population within a particular knowledge worker classification or group that could be allowed to discover content that, that you know, particular set of content that don't necessarily know about it because they're not been given direct access. Right. So I think the way to do that is not to have it be a it's a more of a scalpel approach than a, than a hammer. You're not going to change the culture of a government organization, obviously, but you, you are you can look and say, is there not of the people? that are able to, through, through our current governance constraints, are able to access this content, what percentage of them are actually assigned? And can we be smart about making it dis the content discoverable to the rest of them by, you know, through implementing sort of group level permissions, discoverability at a group level? I love it. Um, so how do you define a govern space? Who's responsible for maintaining it? That's all that one too. So, so the the governance space, the idea of a governance space is that everything that we've shown you here, that you know, uh, uh, discoverability, the ability to see metadata, ability to consume only the good stuff, you know, getting that top ten percent of the content rather than the entire iceberg. That's what a governance space is about. It's about about separating the wheat from the chaff, right? And and making sure that you're you're creating an experience. That that should be much more for for end users more like visiting a museum than like just wandering around through the overgrown forest, right? So there, if you think about a museum, right, you're you're walking around and you're seeing like there's a little placard next to every painting. It explains what's there. Paintings are arranged together thematically in a way that's coherent. It kind of guides in your journey. So a governed space creates that kind of experience, while at the same time ensuring that you're in compliance with all of your key regulatory uh, uh, constraints around you know, classification of data and so on and so forth. Right. So, so that's it. Now, as far as who's responsible for maintaining it, there are different models here. So in some cases, you can go with a centralized model. It, typically, this is more the, what happens in a smaller organization, but you might have one central team that manages the entire space. Obviously, for large enterprises, that's not possible, right? There's just too many assets and too many groups. And so in that situation, you have a kind of a hub and spoke model where you have a center of excellence 
that's responsible for establishing the standards or the guardrails, if you like, for the governed space. You know, they say, here's the category structure, here's where people, where content's gonna live, here's the basic rules, here's what certification needs, here's the high level workflows. And then, and then it, the responsibility for populating the content, it, it goes out to the spokes, the, the potential business units that are content creators that are building that, that content. And that, that's what we typically see in large scale enterprises where you're talking about thousands or tens of thousands of users. I think maybe it, it ties into that next question, uh, Shannon, what, what do we mean by a single pane of glass? I mean, you know, when we talk about this governed space, this portal, you know, oftentimes business users in an organization have access to reporting in, in many different tools, everything from a spreadsheet to on um, SharePoint to a you know, dashboard in a BI tool to a report in Salesforce to a you know, data science model sitting out there somewhere. And we're just talking about having a single place to go and search and find that content, not having to go to many different tools to, to access it and, and look at it. So uh, yeah, again, a single government, probably mixing metaphors, but a single government space, you know, a single pane of glass, you know, one place to, to manage everything. No, I mean, I think the key distinction there is, you know, a single, you could put a whole bunch of links together someplace and it's all one place, right? But if it's governed, it really implies this much more, uh, the curated experience, right? That's the key. Oh, well, Marius and Mike, thank you so much. Uh, there's so many great questions coming in, but we'll make sure and get those over to you. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. But that is, does bring us to the top of the hour. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, recording, and additional information. Mike and Marius, thank you so much. Uh, as always, another great presentation. And thanks to Metric Insights for bringing today's webinar. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.